Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are there any disclosures of interest this evening? <coughs> There being none, that should be so indicated, Madam Clerk. This is a public hearing under the Development Charges Act. Mr. Aquilina, can you take it from here, please? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, staff, and those in attendance this evening. The purpose of this meeting is pursuant to Section 12 of the Development Charges Act. It is considered a proposed bylaw to the Development Charges Bylaw. 6131-97-14. What the proposal is, is to extend the one-year exemption from the development charges for residential and non-residential uses. First, if I may, Mr. Mayor, is the method of this meeting tonight was given in accordance with Section 12 of the, of the Development Charges Act. And we also placed it a notice in the Niagara this week on May, May 11th, 2017. What I will do tonight is I will present the planning and development report. Well, then we'll allow council an opportunity to ask myself any questions for clarification. We will then open it up to any member of the public that wishes to address council. I'll give an explanation of the procedure to be followed after the presentation this evening. This time, Mr. Mayor, what I have done is I've done a brief PowerPoint presentation. This is a short report. It is a short proposal. As I mentioned, is to waive potential exemptions to development for residential and non-residential uses. Important to note that if there were no exemption to the bylaw for a single detached dwelling in the rural area, it is a $5,900 $55 fee and an $8,789 fee for the urban area. For non-residential, commercial and institutional charges are $3.23 a square foot for full services and $1.56 for rural and industrial charges of $1.21 per square feet on full services and $0.57 cents for rural. This slide here will just represent some of the revenue that the city has lost in an effort to entice development. So in 2015, there was $105,000 in lost development charges. In 2016, $130,000. And 2017, $161,000. Those just give an indication how the development charges exemption, you can say, is enticing development. This next slide just shows the different CIP community improvement plan exemptions. All of our exemptions have either a 100% exemption of development charges or a 70% exemption from development charges.
There's one slide I, I think is important. It's part of the public information report, but the one comment that came from Mr. Evan Och, Economic Development Officer, pretty much gives council and the public an indication of the comments and the positives that the exemption has brought forward. And you can see there's more than 60 permits issued for new residential dwellings since 2014. That's when council first instituted the exemption to, to the development charges bylaw. Comment from Mr. Och is that the continu continuation of the exemption indicates that it gives a message that the city's open for business. And council may want to consider if they do not want to support the 100% exemption because there is some lost revenue that council may want to uh, potentially consider a 50% exemption just to co collect some of the revenues that we have lost over the years. So when we circulated the notice, there were two comments that came in. One comment came from the Chamber of Commerce, Port Coburn Wainfleet Chamber of Commerce. I won't really read the letter in verbatim, but they're in full support of the exemption to continue, again, based on the impacts of in economic development. The second letter came in from the Niagara Home Builders Association, July 18th, 2017, again, in full support of the exemption, based on all the positive impacts that the exemption brings forward for potential builders and development purposes. So, Mr. Mayor, that does conclude my report. As I mentioned, it's very brief. I will then open up to any member of council or yourself for any questions or clarification. Mrs. Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Aquilina. You mentioned what the lost revenues were over 2015, 16, 17, but I wondered when, it, when you talk about the 60 permits that were issued, can you put like a value of money that comes back to the city when those 60 permits are, are issued and built and, and what that means in terms of money coming back to the city? And maybe um, maybe a comment on the commercial industrial side. So there's a little bit of stuff happening there too. And do you have any comment on what the, that tangible is back to the city? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Butters, I can actually provide council with the with the actual impacts because a not only do we have building permit revenue, right? B there's also increased taxes mm -hmm. and what that brings forward to the municipality. I can provide that as part of the recommendation report, but obviously it's a positive impact and mm -hmm. development from commercial industrial that can then translate into potential jobs for the municipality. Yeah, I just think it's important when you, you talk lost revenue of 105, 130, and 161,000, it's important to see the flip side of that coin of, yes, those are monies, lost revenues, but the impact back, there's like a dollar figure for that too, so I'd appreciate that as part of the report. Thank you. Councilor Kenny. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, but that was my question as well. I wanted to see in the report the, the flip side of that, the positives. Any other? Because I think there's lots of positives. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Questions from other members of council? Uh, that was my question. Uh, Mr. May. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Dan. Uh, I appreciate the Coles Note version because to me, that makes total sense. It's. Uh, you know, it's not 35 or 40 pages of goobly gop, and at the end of the day, this is, uh, you did a good job, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, I would appear that, that uh, there are no more questions from council. You... Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would like to open it up to members of the public if they wish to address council, but I just, would just like, like to read the following. Any person or organization may appeal a development charge bylaw to the Ontario Municipal Board by following with the clerk of the municipality on or before the last day of appealing this bylaw, a notice of appeal setting out the objection of the bylaw and supporting reasons as to why. At this time, Mr. Mayor, I would open the floor up if anyone would like to address council. If so, please state your name and address, please. Mr. Cheshire, can you come forward? Registered to speak as a delegate on this matter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Good evening, uh, councillors, members of the public, staff. My name is Hugo Cheshire. I'm Policy and Government Relations Manager for the Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce. You probably remember me from the last time I was here speaking about exactly the same thing, I think, so you can probably guess what I'm going to say, so I will be brief. Um, we fully agree with the Economic Development Office's comments on this, and we support uh, the continued waiver. It has been a driver for commerce, and it, does, it is definitely a message that uh, Port Coleman is open for business. Um, you've seen the report on the increase of housing starts since this began. It's also noteworthy that, uh, according to Niagara Workforce Planning Board, the number of construction jobs in Port Coleman has increased 16% since these waivers began, above a general rate of job growth of about 2.5%. And it's also worth noting that those are, generally speaking, good jobs where the average pay is about $76,000 a year compared with the median in Port Colburn, which is 40000 So it's not just a matter of development. It's also a matter of creating these good local jobs as well. And for that reason, we particularly support this. It's also noteworthy that uh, the Niagara region has just changed their development bylaws and made them more expensive. This may have something of a chilling effect on development. And so that's another reason, I think, to continue with this waiver, which will help counterbalance that effect and keep this momentum going. So we do support the, the proposal to uh, extend the waiver by another year. I said I would keep it brief, so I think that's pretty much it. I will be happy to answer any questions, though. Are there any questions of Mr. Cheshire? There being none, thank you, Mr. Cheshire. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the body of the chambers who uh, wish to make a comment on uh, this proposal? There being none. Mr. Yep. Actually, are we ready for an adjournment? Dear. Mr. Mayor, I just like, would like to read one more thing. It's my legal mumbo jumbo that I have to read. But I'll, after, before I read that, I just want to let council know that I will have a recommendation report to council at the earliest convenience, probably at the next council meeting after, after we answer the questions from the council and would bring that forward for council's consideration before the actual bylaw expires. Thank you. Oh, I would like to read the following. If you wish to be notified of the proposed amendment of the bylaw, you must make a written request to the clerk. Only those persons of public bodies that gave the clerk a written request for the adoption notice of the adoption will be given such notice. Mr. Mayor, that does conclude my presentation under the Planning Act, or Development Charges Act. My apologies. Thank you. At this time, I entertain a motion for adjournment. Councillor Butters, seconded by Councillor Kenny. All those in favor? Carried. The meeting is adjourned. We now move on to the regular meeting of the Committee of the Whole, 17 to 17, on today, Monday, July 24th, 1917. Call this meeting to order. Are there any addendum and delegation items, Madam Clerk? Thank you, Mr. Rand, on this evening. I'd entertain a motion to confirm the agenda at this time. Moved by Councillor Bodnick, seconded by Councillor Doucette. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Are there any disclosures of interest tonight? There being none, I call for the adoption of the minutes of the regular meeting of the Committee of the Whole 16-17, held on July 10th, 2017. Moved by Councillor Demeray, seconded by Councillor Kenny. Any questions, comments? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Uh, at this time, I would like to move on to a determination of items requiring separate discussion. Mr. Main. Number three, please. Anyone else? My left. Done. Okay, Mr. Main, I'd entertain your recommendation. Um, the clerk suggests that we need item six to be pulled. And seven. Six and seven. Moved by Councilor Demery. Seconded by. Well, you know. We'll just move on. Mr. Main, you were going to make. Yes, it. number three. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Community Corporate Services, Community Service and Division Report Number. No. We have to vote on the rest of it first. Okay. That sounds reasonable. Yeah. Can I call for uh, 
approval of those items not requiring separate discussion. Moved by Councilor Butter, second by Councilor Main. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. We moving. There are no presentations this evening. There are delegations. Uh, Cynthia Skinner on behalf of the Friends of Port Coburn Lighthouse. Regarding a proclamation, we're going to come forward, Ms. Skinner, and just push the red button if you would like. Mayor, Councilman, our citizens, and our TV people, good evening. Thank you again for allowing me to request the poor Colburn proclaim the 7th of August International Lighthouse Day, just as cities in three dozen other countries also do. There have been several interesting developments since last I spoke. South Coast tourism has produced a high-tech brochure of our lighthouse and Point Abenos, both of them are included in this. They've also burned a DVD featuring the same two lighthouses narrated by Erno Rossi. And an even greater opportunity for exposure will occur with the release of the August issue of Cleveland Magazine. The main feature is an article about the lighthouses at our end of the lake. The material about the area lighthouses was also submitted by Erno Rossi. In the long run, this should benefit us, as Cleveland is less than five hours by car and just a good sail for the sailing enthusiast. There's a decades-old sail competition from Erie to Point Dover to here, so we already have some visitors from those cities, and this will likely increase. I have a story from a few years ago to relate. We were exhibiting at our museum when a guy in a Port Tover t-shirt came over seeking information about our lighthouse tours, but he wasn't from Port Dover. He'd sailed over from Erie to check out what was going on here. He inquired if we offered stamps for lighthouse passports. Well, I only knew about national park passports. He told me about the program and gave me the contact. As a result, Friends of Port Coburn Lighthouse joined the program and now offer stamps to our visitors. Some visitors are on their second and third passport, having seen two and three hundred lighthouses. Last canal days, our visitor numbers were down due to two uncontrollable events. The heavens opened up one afternoon, making it necessary to stop our tours for a while. And the very first morning, stationed at the south side of Elm Street, was an ill-informed, overzealous guard refusing to even allow our team to reach the marina to set up. This translated into few visitors for a while. We had 307 visitors last year versus 410 and 15. Most of our visitors are day trippers from Niagara and western New York. The person who traveled the farthest was from Peru. Friends of Port Coburn Lighthouse remains a small group with overlapping membership with Point Abano Lighthouse Society. Of course, we welcome new members. We meet at the archives the last Monday of the month at 7. It takes all hands on board for our tours nonstop for four consecutive days. We need a greeter, a registrar, a person to fit life jackets, a runner coordinating the boarding, a person monitoring the safety of the stairs, souvenir sales, skipper for the boat, a safety person on the wall, and someone to tell the story of our lighthouses, and a relief person so those on the wall can rotate to shore duty, a sizable team to accomplish our task. This is our labor of love, sharing the lore of our lighthouses as we volunteer for Port Coburn. For anyone who has not yet seen our lighthouses, I hope you'll come and see them this summer. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Any questions of Mr. Skinner? Members of Council, Mr. Bonner? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, not so much of a question, but a, a thank you to Cynthia. She's a tireless worker for tourism and a tourism professional um, and works uh, a lot of hours with the Lighthouse Group. 
So thank you very much. I, I don't think people realize what we have here in those lighthouses. We're just starting to really touch that button and uh, you know with a little help I think we can uh, we can really you've seen those numbers I, I think sometimes you're surprised by wow that many people out there but lighthouses are a huge draw all over the world so you know we've got them uh, best one in Point Avenue so I think we can make them uh, a large part of our tourism effort here so thank you again Cynthia you're welcome thank you for having me thank you Mr. Bonner any other questions uh, I understand that you are having tours on Canal Days weekend. What are the hours? Friday will be a short day from noon until the last boarding at 4. We need the boarding to cease at 4 because we need time for the, those people to go out and see the lighthouse and get everybody off the wall. Then the other days are 10 through 4. Thank you. Mr. Bonner. Just, just one more statement. Uh, Cynthia alluded to those brochures. Um, they are done up fairly well. Um, South Coast Tourism, um, in partnership with the Tourism Partnership in Niagara, uh, we were able to get half the money for these, and we put up the other half. So uh, just another part of what we're doing for tourism in, uh, in the area. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Appreciate it. Good evening. Our next delegation is from Bonnie Dayball on behalf of the Shirkson community regarding Committee of Adjustment Decision in the matter of uh, application A14-17 PC. Uh, you got the red button, just push there. there. Thank you, Ms. Dayball. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, council members, staff, and those in attendance. My name is Bonnie Dayball. I live at 4668 Shirkston Road in Shirkston, City of Port Coburn. I'm here tonight to ask council to direct the Planning and Development Department to appeal the decision made by the Committee of Adjustments on the Minor Variance Application, <coughs> excuse me, number A1417 PC, William Gordon, 970 Empire Road, Shirkston, in the City of Port Coburn. After a discussion with uh, Mr. Aquilina of the Planning Department on Wednesday, July the 12th, uh, that was following our meeting here, I find that the committee has really overlooked the justifi justification report from the city, but also the planning justification report from the region, letters from the OFA, um, who all denied this variance. Um, the Committee of Adjustment stated that it was minor in nature as the sale and service and storage of golf carts will have no adverse impact as an accessory used to the farm machinery sales and service. I don't know how many of you people have been down to view this building. Um, I questioned my, uh, Mr. Aquilina about it because when the building permit was given, I said, given at the time, I said, was there no concern to the size of the doors? Um, you couldn't get a piece of farm machinery in there if your life depended on it. It's meant for golf carts. We all know this. Um, it's not large enough. And the people in the area, Vinstra Farms, Claybrook Farms, Dykstra Enterprises, they're the main large farmers in this area. None of their machinery would go in there. I really don't know uh, where they're going to service it, I guess, in the parking lot. Um, I asked Mr. Aquiline at the time when the... Uh, when the structure was given the permit, uh, were the size of the doors not a consideration? And he said the size of the doors were a consideration at the time. But this tells me that everybody seems to know that this was in the works. Um, it's not going to be agricultural. It, this farm machinery business will never fly, and it'll never, it'll never happen, because he can't get the farm machinery in there. Um, when we, uh, last year, Mr. Garden called a meeting at our community center there on the corner of Empire and Shirkston Road. And uh, when we got there, he had forms all ready for us to sign because he wanted to move his business at that time to the agricultural section and he wanted our support. Of course, he didn't get any. And uh, he told us at the time that he was gonna move his business there with or without our support, whether he liked, we liked it or not. 
that's where he was going. And uh, he also wrote letters to the residents on Empire Road stating if they did not support his move, he would build on the section that the OMB designated and cause havoc and commotion. Well, he told us at the meeting the reason that he wanted to move was because of the fact that the section that the OMB gave him was not big enough for his business. So, you know, he kind of, I think, let that slip. But anyways, I think the Committee of Adjustments, instead of upholding the bylaws and the regulations set forth, I think they were trying to do more of a please everyone attitude. But, you know, in conclusion, between the City of Port Coburn, the Shirkston residents, we have spent almost $50,000. I think it's time now to put some limitations on this. And I think that there really is a solution. Um, I think we should contain him where he is. We know this isn't going to be farm sharing. It's going to be golf cart business. And they suggested giving him 140 meters. This was the uh, Committee of Adjustments. 140 meters from Highway 3, which is the north of the property. Um, I should probably tell you, this is one section of property, but has three different zonings. The north end is agricultural. And Mr. Aquilina actually um, testified at the OMB that there would be no golf carts on this property. And, uh, but here we go. <laughs> but anyways, um, it's in three sections. And then the middle section, uh, which the OMB gave him to build on, is owned uh, uh, Hamlet Development 365, which is allow allowing the golf cart sales and service. Then the other piece at the end, facing the community center on the corner of Empire and Shirkston Road, is HD, which allows for a home business. And um, I think what we should do is contain him where he is, and I think that we should make him rezone the HD 365 and the HD back to agricultural. That'll save the agricultural property, the green strip. That will let him have his golf cart business at the north end of the property. And um, I realize that this is gonna be costly for Mr. Gordon, uh, probably about $30,000, but we've spent, we've spent 50 already. It'll make the people on Empire Road happy because they won't have the confusion, the noise, uh, it'll be good for the church because in three years, I can guarantee you, he will have built that whole piece of property. He'll have his home and his office at the south end, his big business at the, at the north end, and all of his, um, where he stores the golf carts in the middle. When we were here in the meeting, at the last time, at the last time he was here, he hand us, handed out these maps to us. And he has on them, they're, they're not even, proper it says existing agricultural steel building that building is not there it's not existing it's not even there and uh a lot of these things that on this map doesn't jive he was he was stating how much property he needed and they gave him i think 140 meters which uh actually was over and above what these plans showed so that's my solution I hope you'll take it into consideration and uh, have the planning department appeal this. Any comments? <laughs> questions? Are there any questions of Mrs. Dapel from members of council? I have a you have a question, Matt? I have a question, Matt? Mr. Aquilina. Okay, Mr. Aquilina. Um, through you to Mr. Aquilina. It did, didn't you and I talk about this back in the day of switching the zoning from one one end to the other because that would at least make some sense and didn't you tell me then that was not something that we could force a person to do or am i am i having a a senior moment <laughs> through mr mayor to councillor butters no you are correct and that's based on the official plan of the city having that property designated as agricultural so the hamlet residential or the hamlet of shirkson contemplated commercial uses that's why the staff was in support at the OMB to have the commercial business within the Hamlet boundary. Saying that, the Committee of Adjustment and their powers reads the report, comments, and makes the, the determination 
of what they feel based on the application before them that night. They, you know, the history of the property is fine, but the application before them contains all that information. It's up to the committee to make that decision under their powers under the Planning Act, Section 45. If I could follow up on another question with that. So um, could you tell me, I know that there was some conditions put on with that committee of adjustment um, decision. Is that correct? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Butters, that is correct. Could it was conditional. I don't have the actual notice in front of me to actually okay. read the conditions. But as Mrs. Dable had mentioned, there are certain conditions about having a setback of 140 meters yes. and actually um, having some screening to the south of the property. Okay. And if I recall, having 25% of the business allocated to golf carts themselves, 25% okay. of the floor area. Okay, so the percentage of the business then agriculturally would be 75%, is that correct? That is correct. And 25% to the golf cart side of this. Correct, correct, sales and service. So the majority agricultural, <laughs> an obvious minority is the golf cart side. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that. It's, it's already over that. <laughs> well, I, could, I you, I, could, I, could you elaborate? I know that they were concerned how they were going to monitor that. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, there's nothing in there yet. I mean, I don't, I mean, I just drove by it. Excuse me, I just drove by it today. Mm -hmm. And it's still a framed building with n not completed and nothing. I didn't see anything in it agricultural or golf oh, cart wise okay. because they're still in the process of building it. So I don't know what you mean. I by thought that. you were talking about the property. Sir. No, no, I meant, okay. to, the I meant the building okay. and the way that the business is to be structured, I guess, in terms of the committee's condition. Is that fair to say then? 75-25? Mr. Mayor to Council of Voters, absolutely correct. Okay, and then the, the, maybe to follow up on that, how will this be monitored to be sure that the Committee of Adjustments conditions are, meant, are met on an ongoing basis? Is there, is that, that will be covered under bylaw, will it be covered under, like what, what mechanism does that get taken care of, I suppose? Through Mr. Mayor to Councilor Butters, if the appeal does not go forward and the actual decision is final and binding and it gets built. We still have site plan control that is going to talk about how the site is going to be developed and it's going to take into consideration and comments conditions that the committee put in place. Right. Saying that all of that and once it's operational, if upon complaint, it then goes to bylaw enforcement to ensure that the decision from the committee with the 25% is now tied to the property and it would, it would then be monitored that way. Okay. Okay. I'll let speak and I have some closing remarks. Thank you. Anyone else uh, wish to comment on the question? Would it, would it appear, Ms. Butters, you can do your closing remarks. Bob, are you thinking? Yeah. Go ahead. You can be closing, but I may okay. have something from your closing. Okay. Okay, I, I mean, this was a very contentious issue in back in the day when it first went to the OMB. Like, I always thought it was kind of a, it was kind of one of those deals where, I guess in the big overall picture and the Hamlet development, it maybe made sense in one respect, but it didn't make sense in another respect because really the, I, the better place for that business is up at the corner of exactly. Empire and Highway 3 because just location, 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 away from the residents on Empire Road because they were bent right out of shape and rightly so that they didn't want to have their um, enjoyment of their property impacted by um, by all of that too. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly a big side of me that says the Committee of Adjustment is, is writing, is making something right that the OMB couldn't really because of the way planning rules are and agricultural land is like sacred the sacred um, cow of everything, and you don't get to fiddle around with that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but in the common sense world, and where something actually makes sense to go somewhere, that does make sense to be there. And I can remember that conversation with Dan saying, why can't we just do this swap? 
right? And the stuff on the corner at the other end just go whoop, and That's then you, you keep the egg land, but it's at the south end, and you put, put the, the development where it makes sense to go, but that was not something that could be done. Because um, common sense apparently doesn't play much into planning issues from time to time. It would seem from time to time, it just, that's the way it is. So I would not be a fan of, of taking this back to D1B because I don't think, I don't think we, we're going to gain anything in that way. But I think that in terms of monitoring the, to make sure that that's in compliance, I totally agree with you. It needs to be in compliance mm -hmm. and whatever it takes to do that that must happen for this to be a fair solution to that business as well as to the neighbors. So that's my remark. Thank Thanks you, Bob. Kenny. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to add that um, council appoints the members of Committee of Adjustment. There are mm -hmm. citizens on that and there are councillors on that. And that evening, it was a unanimous support of the way um, this property was with the, his business, really his main business, closer to Highway 3 and away from the residents. Um, there were several people who lived on Empire Road that spoke that night and they all said they liked the fact that he was away from them. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that suggested he do some, whether it's a fence, they, they didn't care if it was a fence or if it was, um, you know, the um, any kind of screening to keep his business out of their view. And he's accomplished that. So I feel that the Community of Adjustment did have, um, it did do the right thing. I sit on that committee, I read all the reports, saw those drawings. I, I go by there almost every day on my way to work. You know, um, for the last couple of months, I haven't worked in Fort Erie, but I went by that every day. And when I first saw it, I thought to myself, what is he doing? And then after I went down Empire Road and took a look, and I thought, you know, he's really taken into consideration the neighbors, which, which I thought was a good thing. So. Um, I think it's going to work. Um, I, I found him that evening. I told him he had caused me that night. I said, you've caused me gastrointestinal <laughs> discomfort for months as I went over all this paperwork. But uh, I think it's going to be a good thing in the end. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think the Committee of Adjustment did uh, a good decision that night. I think they took planning can't color outside the lines. Committee of Adjustment looks at it and, and makes a decision. Um, Councilor Butters said common sense, which I think came into it. Um, I know the proponent did say that, uh, and maybe through you, Mr. Mayor, to Dan, that uh, he would consider taking those other, that middle uh, piece of property and, uh, and switching it to uh, Hamlet residential where he could build a home on that is that a possibility through mr mayor to councillor bodner and you just reminded me i believe one of the conditions of the committee was to actually do that rezone that piece of the property that the omb had approved back to a hamlet residential and as well the hamlet residential extending right to the intersection of empire road and shirkson that will be done through the new zoning bylaw that i'm in the process of doing right now. So th that condition that the committee actually requested will be done through the new zoning bylaw. So then just to follow up, Mr. Mayor, that takes that big building uh, fear for the neighbors. I know on Empire Road that we're f about to face that, that building. Um, I think they would prefer to have it simply a field and not have two homes there, but you know, it's a hamlet. So I think we encourage that in a hamlet. So I, I have no appetite for taking this to the OMB for any reason. I think it's the best uh, decision that's made. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be voting to take it to the OMB. Thanks. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? Being none, thank you very much, Mrs. Dayball. Thank you. Appreciate it. Is there anyone else in the body? of the council chambers who wishes to comment on this application. There being none, that concludes the hearing on this matter. If we can move on to uh, the mayor's report, to comment on Pleasant Beach parking. Uh, 
to bring you up to date that our municipal law enforcement officers have had a, have had vehicles towed that have been illegally parked on Pleasant Beach Road. My office has taken calls from some unhappy people whose vehicles were towed. And uh, just a reminder to obey the newly installed signs or risk being towed a uh, fine plus the costs of uh, towing and impounding the vehicle. So it's not a, it's not a cheap affair. Cal Days uh, is one week and away. If you haven't signed up to volunteer yet, please contact Raquel Leger at, at our community services department. And just a, a notice on World Hepatitis Day. On July 28th, the uh, Niagara Health Hepatitis C Care Clinic will be recognizing World Hepatitis Day. This year, a community event will be held at Montebello Park in St. Catharines. The Hepatitis C Care Clinic, which is part of the Niagara Health Mental Health and Addictions Program, is funded through the Ministry of Health, Hepatitis C Secretariat. The program mandate is to provide care to the marginalized population, which may fall between the cracks of the health care and social services systems to provide a safety net to ensure everyone receives the care they need when they need it. Hepatitis B and C are two life-threatening liver diseases, and that is why we recognize that a key goal of each year's World Hepatitis Day event is to encourage Niagara residents to get tested, tested and know their status, especially because of the new highly effective and tolerable therapies for Hepatitis C that are now available. Come out to Montebello Park on July 28th and learn more about this disease. That concludes uh, my uh, mayor's report. The regional council's report, uh, Mr. Barry is not with us tonight, so there will be no report. Um, move on to item number 12 on your agenda. Uh, council's issues or inquiries. Uh, members of council, do you uh, w wish to comment? Uh, Councilor Butters, Councilor Main. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, very quickly, through you to um, Mr. Louis. So um, the mayor mentioned about um, towing of cars at Pleasant Beach. I was talking to one of the residents today and they have they have some concerns about with the long, the next long weekend coming up and, and the um, presence of bylaw enforcement out in that area considering it's canal days. Do we have like some assurance from, from your, you and your staff that there will still be some presence of bylaw enforcement out that way or, or is canal days gonna suck it all inside the city limits. Jail. Sure, through your worship to Councillor Butters, um, it is our plan. Uh, we, we do operate over Canal Days weekend with less officers than in the past because when we added the single new officer, we eliminated the contract with Black Knight that did parking enforcement. So we are stretched kind of thin when it comes to security, or uh, sorry, parking enforcement, especially during Canal Days. But we do schedule workers uh, by law enforcement staff. We do have a student as well who can't write tickets but can help with enforcement activities. As long as we get to our main areas where there's no parking in the downtown core before the, you know, um, before the traffic starts, for example, along Kent Street where one side of the parking is blocked off, as long as we can do that in the morning before lunch, we can make sure that in the prime time at the beach, we can get officers down there on a, on a route to sort of go along, do the tickets, do the uh, towing. The other thing we will lean on during canal days is the NRP. The police can issue parking tickets. It's typically not uh, their want to do so because it's not the best use of their resources. Um, but we will be calling on them to help us with parking enforcement during in the downtown core as well as at the beach. So, so I can short answer, yes. Residents, they are still on the radar. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Bain. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Operations for making my day today by patching up the Elm Street Sugarloaf Railway Crossing. That took a, uh, a load off my shock absorbers and I think another 90% of the people here in town. Uh, and the other issue is not so much uh, my concerns uh, with the city. But this week's paper in the, in the Standard, uh, there was a beautiful picture of the Niagara Health uh, Systems, uh, Susan Johnson uh, making the big presentation for a big upgrade at the Shaver uh, Hotel Do site. And I thought, you know, 
and this is a pet peeve of mine, and I've been talking about it for a few years. We had that nice fancy sign on the lawn saying we're going to put whatever it was, two, two and a half million dollars to fix our, uh, our little urgent care center up. Uh, we had Susan here last year, and uh, she talked a lot, but never got to that point. And I would like to know if the mayor's office could extend an invitation to Ms. Johnson to come back uh, before council and uh, answer a few questions from council. We can do that, Mr. Wayne. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Doucette, and then Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Through you to um, Chris. We fixed the railroad tracks on Elm Street. I realize that the one at the end of Kalali Street, just before the bridge, is supposedly regional. We've been promised that it was going to be done in May, then the end of May, beginning of June. And if I remember right, I went by the other day and I've just been back in town and it's still not fixed. So what's happening there? Do we have any idea what the region is doing? Mr. Lee. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Doucette. <clears throat> uh, I actually, I drove across that about an hour ago, so I know what you're talking about. Uh, that being said, um, I had discussions with uh, Trillium Rail about two weeks ago with regards, regards to their interaction with the region and fixing those um, yep. crossings. <clears throat> that being said, they said that they were waiting for the go-ahead from the region to start the project. I will contact my counterpart uh, tomorrow and uh, try to put a little push on the equation. Just uh, follow-up. Go ahead, Mr. Kassat. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, is this going to have to be another one of these where we harass until we finally got our our cross, crossing on uh, on Main Street? We had to harass, 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 and then finally they said we better do it because we're going to be in trouble. Is this going to be the same thing? Because if it is, then let's start harassing now, big time. Okay. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Doucette. Um we have been doing that on our side of the equation, so, and I will leave it at that. Mr. Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to uh, take up on your uh, comments on Pleasant Beach parking, um, I can assure you that that is working. I just got an email from a local newspaper that uh, sent a um, reporter out there to do a story, and the reporter parked in a uh, illegal spot uh, while they were apparently on the beach. I guess I haven't called her back yet, but, uh, and her car was towed, so it's, it's working, working pretty good, I guess. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Chris. Uh, Chris, I received an email from some avid trail walkers on our trail that also use Fort Erie's trail system, and they say there's a noticeable difference in how Fort Erie keeps their trails well trimmed back, uh, you know, really looking great, and then they get on our trails, and it's sumac overgrown, coming, seems to be coming in. Uh, so anyways, I wonder if you can comment on that. Are, are we keeping our trails up? Have we, what, what are we doing? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bodner. Um, yes, we are maintaining the trails um, to the extent of Fort Erie. I can't comment on that. I haven't personally seen that. But that being said, the dollars that were budgeted by council this year for trail maintenance have already been spent for the tree removals and shrub and uh, vegetation control. But uh, we also have some other funds that are currently available through a granting process for signage and for um, augmenting the trail uh, system as a whole. So in talking with staff, uh, they're putting together a complete plan on uh, revisiting the signage this year putting in new signage installations, um, uh, everything from mileage accounts to uh, safety signage to uh, uh, <clears throat> locationing on the trail itself. So that's part of that process. So they'll be continuing to do maintenance on an ongoing basis. Just to follow up on that is, so we had a lot of ash trees to come down, as you said. I think, didn't we spend, can you remind me what that dollar figure was to take those out? 
Um, my recollection through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Barner was somewhere in the vicinity of 50000 Right. And we have spent that already. So, so on a, let's say, a normal year, and we weren't spending that money. Okay. So was that money earmarked for the trail, or did we go someplace else and uh, grab that money for that? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Barner. That was trail-specific funds. Okay. So then on what... I would say as a normal year, we don't have to do the uh, the um, ash tree takedown. Would we be spending then more money on the maintenance, brushing back, or or are we? Is that just the way we do our trail with the brush moving in? Again, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bodner, that fifty thousand expenditure was a one time that Council had given us to do the maintenance because okay. of the ash trees. Okay, so then. If we want more maintenance, we got to put more money in, obviously. Is it as simple as that? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bodner. Correct. Okay. Okay, just so that at, you know, budget time, if we're thinking uh, it magically happens, it doesn't, we got to put more money in. Okay. One, one more, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Um, so, something new to me. Um, I got a call uh, from someone on second concession that um, a beekeeper had moved a bunch of bees in um, beside their house in the farmer's field, which, you know, we see those more and more now. I mean, there's, there's lots of, uh, lots of uh, places for bees and that they're gathering the honey. But what happened was it did increase the amount of bees in their yard and they have a pool and they were afraid really to use with the kids. So, I assume this all worked out because I didn't get a call today. So she did some research and found out <coughs> the farmer that owned the property and the farmer gave the name of the person that put the hives there. And calling that person, they were to remove, relocate those hives somewhere else on the property. And apparently that happened today. But um, so I just wanted to kind of bring that out as a public service. I mean, I think we're all want to see the bees survive and do a good job but occasionally that might infringe on somebody else's uh, stuff so there's a process and I don't believe it's the city I think she had phoned the city and the city said is it the Ministry of Agricultural and they actually have a bee inspector so in our area too I think so they will come out and and uh, assess the situation so if it happens to anybody else there is a solution and Quite possibly, just calling the person that owns those uh, those beehives, and and they'll re relocate them. So, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Very quickly, please. Uh, Dad, just to compliment our staff, when that lady called here for help, they were able to give her the number and the contact person in the Ministry of Agriculture. So, thanks to our staff, that really did help, you know, push that process along. When that poor lady had no idea what to do mm -hmm. and she happens to be highly allergic to bees as on top of it all so thanks to us thanks thank you councilor demory thank you mr mayor um three items uh, two of them have already been mentioned i just have more to add to them um first uh, through you mr mayor to chris Chris, the, the crosswalk on Main Street East uh, that was put in by the region, the one that Councillor Desai was just speaking about, do we have a, a, a time frame on when that's, that is actually going to be completed? Because there's still some, some things left undone on that. To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Desai. <clears throat> or to Councillor Demery, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Anyway, um, no, I don't have any uh, current information on that, but we can investigate that further. Okay, thank you. It's just a, a matter of being able to, uh, it's the accessibility issue that, that is going on there. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and the uh, next item would be on the trails that was uh, brought up by Councillor Bodner. I've had four complaints um, just in the last week about our trails in Port Colborne as compared to trails throughout the region. <clears throat> and this, these are by people who um, are avid cyclists and use all the trails, uh, the Circle Route and some of the offshoots as well. And they are of the opinion that the Port Colborne trails are kept to the barest, most minimum standards. Um, and that is something that they, they 
don't love about using Port Colborne trails, and they asked me that if there is any way that we could change that. So, um, and I do understand that, that this is a budget matter. Um, I'm just uh, suggesting that possibly, Chris, your department could take a look at um, what we do, how much it costs, what more we should or could be doing, and what more that would cost so that when um, our next budget meeting comes, we have the proper information to, to make a, a decision on changing the um, standards of maintenance on that on the trails. To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Demery, we can definitely put together a package at uh, budget time that will give you an upscaled, if you would, uh, service in that regard. That's great. Thank you so much. And my last item is, is simply um, one of, of gratitude for our staff. I, I was um, pleasantly surprised to come home from a meeting the other day and find a bouquet of flowers and a nice thank you note on my front porch for someone getting their sidewalk fixed. And I felt a little bit guilty about that because, I mean, as counselors, we, we don't all we ever do is just send an email or make a phone call. It's, we, there's not really much more than that involved. The staff is the one who really carries the burden of getting the job done. So thank you if uh, all of you as directors could spread that thank you to all of your staff members because they certainly make things nice for all of us. But uh, there are people out there in the community who probably have a, need a better idea of who, really, who it really is that's getting those jobs done. But uh, thank you again. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lee, uh, just uh, another query on the... Uh, pedestrian traffic at the corner of uh, Catherine and Clarence Street uh, is still troublesome. We continue to, to uh, get re complaints. Um, could you advise me what the process is? Uh, the request has been for a crosswalk, uh, but of course that will require further consideration, just a, a request. Could you elaborate on where we stand with that and what we need to do? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, I'd had a discussion with staff uh, a few weeks ago with regards to that when it was first brought to our attention. Uh, that being said, it was uh, to be addressed in the uh, traffic st safety study um, with recommendations on the type of crossing based on pedestrian counts and things of that nature. So as it stands now, we're in those stages of planning what that crossing should be and what it should entail. So once that study is completed, we have those numbers, we have those facts and figures, then we can come forward to council with a budget request and address it accordingly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chief, we had an incident uh, on Mitchell Street this year where uh, you were required uh, individuals to be removed from our residence uh, because of uh, unsafe uh, conditions. Could you elaborate upon that? Your Worship, certainly if you, if you wish. Um, Obviously, we made the press uh, over the last past this past weekend. Uh, just an update for the people that are watching on Kojiko this evening. Uh, this all started on uh, May the 19th um, when we initially received a complaint with regards to combustible materials being stored against the building. Um, I was away, but the, my deputy and the fire prevention officer immediately reacted to that, and it was a late Friday afternoon. And they were able to get public works to assist with a backhoe and two dump trucks to remove a large amount of combustible materials uh, around the building. While they were there, they did a full inspection of the building and found it to, to not have a lot of uh, smoke alarms that were required, plus there were additional issues inside. Uh, they, they had our guys go over and we installed smoke alarms, and it's been an ongoing situation since then with more combustible materials and ongoing uh, removal and or uh, disarming of or covering up smoke alarms. Uh, up until the point of uh, this past uh, Monday, we again went over to uh, look at the building and lo and behold, we found it to be in disrepair again. Uh, the things that were ordered under the initial inspection hadn't been completed. Um, a couple of things had been started, but a majority of them hadn't been completed. And again, we found smoke alarms that had been disarmed, covered with plastic bags or removed. Um, so it got to the point where we made a, a quick uh, decision to uh, contact the Office of Fire Marshal and uh, I requested, or I actually didn't request because I have the, the authority to do it, we initiated the response under the FPPA to uh, close the building. Uh, I will say that I've been in this job for over 40 years. I've been here as a chief for 16 of those years. 
elsewhere as a chief for 17, seven of those years and elsewhere as a deputy in, in six years, for six years. And this is only the second time that we've had to invoke this type of uh, action in this in our city here. Um, quite frankly, the, the building uh, was a hazard uh, when they initially went on the 19th of May. Uh, there's only supposed to be uh, nine people on the second and third floors. And just to give you an idea, there's only one exit from the second and third floors um, through a narrow uh, hallway and staircase. And when they went in on the 19th, they found 17 people on the second and third floors. Um, obviously, uh, escape in the event of a fire in a building like that would be next to impossible, especially if it were to be lit in the stairwell. Um, that also pushed us forward to make, make a decision. And then when we went in on last Monday, we now found cooking taking place in the, in the hallway. Um, there's been reports, people were interviewed saying that's not true. I can reassure council that in fact it is true. We photographed everything. We've got over 200 pictures of this property over the last six weeks. I will also tell council that there's going to be a number of orders, I'm sorry, a number of charges laid against the owner. And in one case, the tenant, the superintendent, because he in fact, out of his apartment on the garage, removed a smoke alarm that we had installed. So he is going to be charged. Um, it's becoming very frustrating that we're trying to deal with properties such as this, but I will also reassure you that we will do our very best to ensure that the people at least either are able to get out, get early warning, or we'll remove them from the properties if, as necessary. We hope we never have to do it again, but we are prepared to do it. And if I could just add one other thing, it's interesting what's taking place in the city. Uh, over the last few days, our, our crews, our full-time guys are out every day, day and night, uh, doing smoke alarms. And right now we're working on Kalali Street East. And I will tell you that over the last three days, they've gone to 22 homes, 19 used us getting in. Let us in, we will help you. Uh, and carbon monoxide alarm. Asking for is minimal. If it pay, so you're trying to help keep you safe. Thank you. Thank you. Responses. There being none, we can now move on to consideration of those items requiring separate discussion. But Mr. Byer, you have something. I just want to pick up on what the, on what the chief said. So, uh, so 19 homes and said refused you um, entry, um, but I understand that they can request. This is from an, uh, a former conversation we had. They can request. Uh, that they can set an appointment for you to come back? Is that not true? Your Worship, uh, Councillor Bodner and, and Council, that's correct. Um, and that the letter that they will receive will certainly clearly say that because when we leave the second time, if we're not allowed in, they're given information with regards to contacting us for an appointment. And we will go 24 hours a day, seven days a week to install smoke alarms if necessary. Thank you. Uh, those items then, I have not, no further inquiries. Uh, item number three, Mr. Main, that was yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Community and Corporate Services, Community Service Division, report number 2017-123, subject to 39th Annual Canal Days Marine Heritage Festival request for road closures and parking restrictions. Was there a seconder for the recommendation? Councilor Kenny, discussion? Yeah, um, I'm in support of, of the closures, but I was just wondering whether we could put the barriers in different locations on the little side streets that go towards West Street. Uh, I have a couple of uh, people who are uh, have difficulty moving around, and if the if the uh, the barrier is on the King Street, like I'll give you Adelaide Street for an example. If they close Adelaide Street, uh, it's hard for those people to get in and out. 
And I was wondering whether those barriers could be moved just to the east to where the, the industrial part starts of uh, where uh, Lake Erie maintenance is. I think there's three or four houses there. And you know, you, you know what I'm saying, Chris, where they are? Is that possible to move them back? Uh, or do you think that would create havoc? Mr. Lee or Mr. Sinus? To you, Mr. Mayor, to <clears throat> Councilor Maine. It may create a parking zone that we would have to <laughs> really monitor. Uh, that's our only fear in that equation. People are going to pull into there and park and block the area, and we won't have the egress that we need. I see. Like you, what you're saying is they might fill up the whole street. Okay. So if, if one of those people does have difficulty getting in and out with their car, uh, and some of them are, are, are handicapped. How do we move the barrier? Like, you, you know what I'm saying, to get in and out? Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Main. Um, the movement of the barrier, I mean, we have staff around, we have bylaw enforcement, we have different individuals that can aid. Um, we don't, wouldn't want that to be the case with a volunteer. We want somebody that was on staff that did something like mm -hmm. that. So if we knew that there was a need, I think that we can address that. Thank okay. You. Sorry. Question. So I'm not sure what uh, three worship to Councillor Maine. I'm not sure what Mr. Sinesse is going to add. Um, it is an issue. I've only been on staff for two canal days, but I've attended many canal days as a visitor. Um, the, the problem we get is that, and I understand that the residents on those streets are affected by the barriers. But the, the worst effect that we get, and we've even had this lately with people moving the barriers and bringing in their own car to park, and what they do is overhang the driveways and they block the residents in, which is an even worse outcome. Um, we, one idea, Mr. Sinesse's uh, input would be welcomed. Uh, we usually have somebody manning the phones at City Hall. If a person wanted to get a call, it's only a two-minute drive in a golf cart. I'm usually doing it myself, and some of the staff are doing it themselves, where we get out and we run errands on the golf carts. We could probably get the barriers moved very quickly for somebody who's in that situation. But the risk of eliminating the barriers is that we'll end up with an open season down there where people are blocking residents into their driveways and disappearing for hours at a time. So that is a legitimate issue, and I'll defer to Mr. Sinesse's input. Mr. Yeah, three, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the other concern that we'd have is uh, if if uh, we don't close them off at uh, King Street, and as uh, Mr. Louis mentioned, they get blocked within the the, the street itself, then then we also are uh, are uh, eliminating or making it difficult for emergency services uh, to get to West Street because mm -hmm. basically they try to get they will try to, correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, but they will try to get to West Street through the side streets because it, it's very difficult to get down West Street, as you know. Um, the other thing over the years that I've been doing it, when I'm walking down there or going down there on golf carts, half the time the barriers are moved anyway. Um, you know, we're constantly closing them because people are going through and opening them. And uh, so half the time they're open as it is. And uh, the problem that we have, we had a complaint not too long ago, not a complaint, but a uh, just mentioning to us of the problems that we've had in the past of cars still going through and parking in front of their driveways and then the residents can't get out of their driveways. So it's, it's we, we've talked about in the past of moving the barricades to uh, West Street and keeping that all open, um, but then there's the, the, the concern of cars just parking everywhere on those side streets and, uh, and making it difficult to get in and out uh, because I know that uh, um, there's suppliers that uh, the vendors, suppliers will, will, will also tend to go down those streets and some of them will park at the end of, of West Street. Um, and um, so it's difficult to really have a, a good solution. We, the only time we've ever monitored the, um, uh, the barricades was uh, during the tall ships uh, that we had, um, but we don't have enough volunteers and to put volunteers in charge of the barricades is, is also a risk um, liability wise. Um, and uh, to staff it would be all, you know, 24 seven would be, would be quite costly for us. So we try to, staff I know do go, do, do go by them and we'll try to monitor them as we go along. And we do have bylaw enforcement on and we do have um, 
Uh, switchboard is uh, is open uh, during the day till seven o'clock at night. Uh, so there aren't any concerns. We've had people call us in the past where they would call City Hall and then we would send out bylaw enforcement out to a particular residence if there was an issue with uh, vehicles uh, uh, blocking their driveways and so on. Thank you, Mr. Sines. Uh, yeah, any just, other questions? Just one quick comment. So thank you, Peter, through uh, Mayor to Peter. Uh, so that could be an alternative then to make everybody happy. If these people do have an issue with moving the barrier because of, you know, physical difficulties, uh, they could call the switchboard and somebody in the golf cart come help them in and out. Would that be? A, okay, that's good. That's good to know. Thanks. Any other questions on this issue? There being none, uh, we have the recommendation moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Next item is item number six, which uh, requires separate consideration. This is a request uh, of, by the Fair Trade Committee that we have uh, a member of council sit on their uh, on their board. And the reason this is a requirement now of uh, the main Fair Trade body, uh, and uh, I say we were the first Fair Trade Committee in uh, Canada. And we would like to continue. We we want them to satisfy the requirements of their national body. So, is there any member of council who would care to sit on this board? Councilor Kenny. Then we uh, we can have that nomination. But it's a move by Councilor Demaray, seconded by Councilor Butters, that Councilor Kenny be appointed to the Fair Trade Town Committee. I think a, a mover and a seconder. All uh, those in favor? Is that fine, Madam uh, Clerk? Similarly, number seven has to be pulled. It's a request uh, from the Regional Intermunicipal Transportation Committee to have a member of staff uh, to, from Port Coburn to sit on the, the, uh, the transit working group. Mr. CAO, do you have a recommendation? Sure. So through your worship, uh, this is one that slipped through. Last week when I was reviewing the agenda, the recommendation before council is that the director of engineering and operations be selected as the city's representative on the IMT working group. That's intermunicipal transit. Uh, the fact is that I think that's a pretty important file, and I do trust the director of engineering to do that, but I had already had discussions with regional staff about me myself representing the city on council in the city's behalf and if we approve this recommendation that will not happen so if it pleases council to have the CAO as the as the working group member and if the director doesn't object I think we would need to change that I'm not sure if we have to vote it down or amend it amendment to replace director with CAO if everyone's okay with that Mr. Demery you have a comment Yes, Mr. Mayor, I would like to uh, put forward the amendment that uh, we replace the Director of Engineering with the CAO. To serve Is there a that. seconder for that amendment? Moved by Councillor Kenny. Call for a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you, Mr. CAO. That would appear to uh, conclude our agenda. Are there any notices of motion? There being none, I call for a motion to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Kenny, second by Councillor Doucette. All those in favor? It's carried. We'll move on to. Uh, <laughs> Move on to the regular meeting of council 22-17 for Monday, July 24th. I would call that meeting to order. <coughs> Are there any addendum items, Madam Clerk? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, none this evening. There are not. I would entertain a motion to confirm the agenda. Moved by Councilor Doucette, second by Councilor Bodner. All those in favor? Carried. Are there any disclosures of interest tonight? 
There being none indicated that we should record that, Madam Clerk. We're moving for adoption of minutes, a special meeting of council, 18-17, held on June 26, 2017, and a regular meeting of councils, 19-17, held on July 10th, 2017. Moved by Mr. Bodner, seconded by Mrs. Kenny. Any discussion? All those in favor? Carried. There's nobody opposed. The approval of items not requiring separate discussion, as long as we determine those items which may require separate discussion. Are there any? Councilor Kenny? There ain't being none. So there'll be a motion to uh, approve uh, those items not requiring separate discussion. I think Councilor Doucette, Councilor Kenny. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, proclamation of the Lighthouse Day, August 7, 2017. Do we have uh, this mover to uh, proclaim Lighthouse Day and a seconder? Moved by Councilor Bodner, seconded by Councilor Butters. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Minutes of the boards, committees, and commissions and committees, there are none. Consideration of bylaws, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Recite Mayor. Those. That the following bylaws be in action and passed bylaw 64996617, being a bylaw to authorize entering into a transfer payment agreement with the Minister of Tourism, Culture, and Sport respecting the Celebrate Ontario 2017 grant. Bylaw 65006717 being a bylaw to establish and regulate the Port Colborne Farmers Market. Bylaw 65016817 being a bylaw to temporarily close sections of various streets for the 2017 Canal Days Marine Heritage, Heritage Festival. Bylaw 65026917 being a bylaw to temporarily close sections of various streets for the purpose of the Battle of Britain Parade. And bylaw 65037017 being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the proceedings of council at its regular and special meetings of July 24, 2017. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, we have a mover, a seconder for those bylaws. Moved by Councillor Demery, seconded by Councillor May. Any discussion? There being none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. We've come to the uh, end of our agenda, except uh, we need a motion to, for council to go into closed session. Could someone make that motion, Mr. Bodner? Can you read that out, please, sir? Yes, please. Uh, I'll have the clerk read it out for us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The council do now proceed into closed session in order to address the following matters. Planning and Development Economic Development Division Report Number 2017-114 concerning the potential disposition of city-owned land pursuant to the Municipal Act Subsection 2392C, the proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. Item B, Planning and Development Planning Division Report 2017-122 concerning the potential disposition of city-owned land pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001, subsection 2392C, a proposed or pending acquisition of dispos or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. And finally, Item C, presentation by the Chief Administrative Officer regarding the CAO performance appraisal, self-assessment pursuant to Municipal Act 2001, subsection 2392B, personal matters about an identifiable individual inclu including municipal or local board employees, and subsection 2392D, labor relations or employee negotiations. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Can we have uh, a motion to accept that? Moved by Councillor Main, seconded by Councillor Doucette. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. We will now move into closed session. We'll deal with those items. Thank you very much.